Hi everyone, just a small message, we will be uh, live in three minutes. Hi everyone, welcome back uh, for this uh, third session of the day and third panel of the week actually. Um, during this next hour, we'll talk about uh, the uh, operational situation. Um, and for that, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Nick Darling that will be our moderator here. Nick? Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, I am Nick Darling. I am the uh, Director of Digital Strategy for um, Major League Soccer Players Association, which is the union that uh, represents the players in negotiations with Major League Soccer. Um, I, <laughs> that title basically covers a wide range of things. I manage everything from our brand to our digital content, websites, uh, mobile applications, and our IT infrastructure. Um, so I am, we're a relatively small organization, but I'm joined today by uh, a few other people who I'll let introduce themselves. Uh, so uh, John Shapiro from Coho Creative. Uh, I'll let John uh, say hi. Hey everybody. Um, my name is uh, John Shapiro. I'm the president and chief creative officer at Coho Creative. Uh, we're a brand strategy, innovation and design company uh, with offices in Cincinnati and Chicago. Um, we, uh, we specialize in creating, evolving, and growing brands in a wide array, or for a wide array, array, excuse me, I haven't had enough coffee yet, guys, <laughs> for a wide array of clients, uh, from Fortune 100 companies all the way to, to startups, and, and I'm very happy to be here today. Okay, thanks, John, and uh, next we have Adam from Heal, he's a 
VP of IT and security. And tell us a little bit about what you do. Hey guys, I'm Adam Baya, uh, VP of IT. Basically, uh, Heal is an app that you can download and we bring the doctor to your living room. Uh, we're currently operating in about seven markets and uh, we're in full network with all insurance providers. Um, so we feel that, you know, the doctor experience at this moment in time is, is really rough. I mean, the average time it takes to book a visit with your doctor is about two weeks. We can generally see patients within 24 hours. So uh, we're on the forefront of this COVID-19 pandemic and uh, we've been seeing patients both via telemedicine and in their the living room. So that's a little bit about HEAL. Thanks, Adam. And uh, last but not least, we have Jehan Aziz, who's from John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Hi, I'm Jahan Aziz. Uh, as you said, I work at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. I'm the section supervisor for client management and security, which means that I manage the Mac team, the all the backups for uh, desktops and laptops, as well as um, now we've got Enterprise Box running, so I manage that as well. Um, and deal with all the security stack for the Mac stuff. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, so we're here uh, today, I am told to talk mainly about operations, which as I said, is a, a sort of a sliver of my job. I think you're gonna probably find that my compatriots here are gonna be a little more uh, deep in the weeds on that than I am to some extent, so I'm gonna let them do a lot of talking. Um, but the big thing we want to talk about today, obviously, is the organizational challenges that have been brought about by the recent crisis. And so uh, a lot of what we do, obviously, is maintaining operations, you know, in a set idea of what our business runs like. And that set idea has been thrown pretty out the window for a lot of us. So maybe we can just go and talk a little bit about what's changed for your organization as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. You know, for us, we, the day the NBA shut down was the day we realized that sports were shutting down in general. And, you know, we basically had a meeting in our conference room with our staff. We're a very small organization where we decided that at the end of the day, we were walking out of the office and not coming back for the foreseeable future. Uh, I don't think, Many of us had a good grasp that the foreseeable future would be over 60 days down the line now at this point, I think. Um, but it was a very quick transition um, without a lot of lead in our prep time. So I know different organizations have had different levels of preparedness for this and maybe saw this coming a little further out. So I uh, just want to go around and maybe talk a little bit about that immediate impact, how you guys felt it where you are. Uh, and what it's done to the way that your staff is working right now. Um, so we can go in the same kind of order we did, John, if you want to lead off on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, the biggest change, obviously, for us was working from home. We're not used to that here at, at Coho. We um, were an extremely social and collaborative group. Um, and, you know, we, it, it was a big challenge to figure out how do we work remotely. Um, our, our process is very um, traditional still. We still do a lot of sketches. Um, it's very tactile. We like to pin things up on walls, things like that. Um, and it's, it's just, it's more of a physical process. So not being able to do that, um, we needed to overcome that challenge. Um, so one of the, you know, things we had to do was think about how do we work remotely with a virtual collaboration platform, which we had experimented with, but we really didn't, um, implement until until this happened. Um, so that was one thing is how do we find the, the right one? Um, and then also because culture is so important to us here, um, they, you know, people love, love the face-to-face -face communication. And we also try to balance in a lot of fun activities. Um, so, you know, we, we really wanted to maintain that, you know, and not having that personal um, connection was was difficult. So, um, that was probably even a bigger challenge for us than than even trying to find a virtual collaboration platform. Yeah, I could I could definitely understand that maintaining company culture through this is going to be challenging, and everybody going and working remotely. Are, Adam, have you seen? Uh, did your staff go largely remote, or are you guys still in offices? Because I know you're on no, the front lines of this. Yeah, we're we're 100% remote. Um, we had actually been planning 
the last two, three years, uh, we have something called the disaster recovery plan or business continuity plan that we've been testing every now and then. Uh, uh, basically, even the building here a few weeks ago had to have power shut down. And um, we've always done these kind of tests to, to mitigate any type of uh, business uh, disruption. Um, I think the biggest thing for us really was uh, going from sending doctors to your house at the initial visit to, to doing a telemedicine call first to kind of check the patient's um, symptoms to make sure that they weren't, uh, you know, they didn't have any of the COVID symptoms. And if they didn't, we would then see them in their home, obviously, with all the masks. And, and that was another challenge is getting enough masks and, and COVID tests to, to do in your home for a lot of our patients. Um, but thankfully, the operations team, we, we have been having them work from home on weekends since January before we knew anything about, you know, coronavirus or COVID-19 and how it was going to affect us. Um, so we were pretty much ready for that, thankfully. And what does your typical setup look like? Are you all in, you know, how many offices do you so, have? What kind of places? So we've got, we've got uh, offices in San Francisco, San Diego, Orange County, Atlanta, Georgia, New York, and New Jersey. Um, so we, we pretty much use everything cloud-based. Um, we use, uh, you know, Zoom obviously for our meetings. Uh, we, we have, a, we've always had a VPN because of patient data. We, we always needed to be uh, pretty secure. So when people needed to work remote, we always allowed for that, obviously with all the security precautions in place. Um, but uh, so the people were kind of used to it, you know, being, we're, we're a healthcare company, but we're also, we're mainly a tech company. It's kind of like a mix between. So it was kind of the best of both worlds. So we're, 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 we're pretty lucky in that sense. Nice. And then uh, how have things changed at John Hopkins there, John? Um, so, you know, when we, we had a very small percentage of people that would work from home, um, partly because we also do a lot of classified work. Uh, so you got to be on site to, to do that. Uh, but even, even then, you know, even our, our IT folks that didn't work on that stuff, um, it was a pretty, you know, you know, maybe we had people that would work, you know, one or two days a week from, from home. Um, so that was, you know, a big shift for us switching to, to work from home a hundred percent. Um, and we do have people that are having to go into the office to work on some of that classified work. So they've, you know, they've got new procedures now for, you know, when you go in, you've got to, you know, have your contact tracing log and, you know, so that in case, you know, something happens later, you can check your, you know, who you've been in contact with and, the last couple of weeks and, you know, notify them, et cetera. Um, and then they're even doing stuff where we're controlling how many people are allowed in certain rooms at, at certain, at, you know, during the day and, you know, flexing those schedules, et cetera. So it's, it's been a pretty big, you know, change for, for us. Yeah, I would imagine. And what is it, can you give everybody an idea of the scale of your organization and kind of, you know, what you're, so we have, um, you know, staff, you know, for the whole organization is about 8,500 people uh, where our campus is like, I think it's, you know, 400 acres or something. Uh, it's, it's huge. We got like, you know, 30 some buildings or, or something. Um, so it's, it's a lot of people, um, big, big place. I mean, you know, it's like, it looks like a university campus. Um, and the IT portion of that is, you know, we've got, you know, over a hundred, you know, it's probably like 150 people total. All right. So yeah, pretty significant uh, group to have to deal with. And I, I'm interested in going back because, you know, everybody's working at kind of different levels and, you know, some people are more used to being at home. Some people aren't. Um, John, I think hit an important point that we think about a lot. We're a very small team. You know, we got, 18, 20 people in the office regularly. We work very closely as John's team does. Um, but we also have a lot of guys out on the road typically interacting with player leadership around the country. That's obviously not possible anymore. Uh, but we need to maintain those connections between our player representatives and our staff um, because that's vital to the sort of solidarity and, you know, that we have to sort of maintain as we deal with huge issues in our space, which is sports aren't happening now. And we, our guys are worried about their job security and worried about 
their pay and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, maintaining, I think, those personal connections and helping people not only from an IT standpoint, but from a, from a human perspective. Um, maybe John can talk a little about that since he brought that up. You know, how, what types of tools have you used to kind of keep people connected? What types of strategies have you used to keep people connected in your organization through this? Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Um, you know, we we use quite a bit of different uh, different tools. Of course, there's all the uh, we use almost every single uh, video conferencing platform out there: Zoom, uh, WebEx, um, Google Hangouts. We we use Google Hangouts quite a bit. Um, but in terms of other things, I, I mentioned the virtual uh, collaboration platform. We ended up with a, a, a product called Concept Board, um, which was amazing for us. It was extremely intuitive. Um, and it really was able to get us to replicate our, our process uh, virtually um, and then also added a lot of efficiencies as well. Um, but I want to give a little bit of props because we don't, we don't do this internally. We actually have a group that we work with out of Washington, D.C., um, a group called Electrana. We've been working with them for the last six years, almost six years. And uh, they've really helped us set up ourselves. You know, we're, we've, we've been kind of getting ready for this, even though we didn't know it was coming, um, because they, uh, they've really I mean, they've migrated us to cloud-based platforms, Google Suite. Um, we, all, all of our HR is done on, on cloud-based platforms like uh, Bamboo and, and Lattice, things like that. So did that answer your question? I hope I did. Yeah, no, I think, I think you touched on a little bit. I think the you know, I, we're going to get into that a little bit more too. this idea of how we've gotten to this point where we're able to still function um, as a group. But I'm curious from from the other guys here, um, you know, is there have you, you know, Adam, your team seems like they're more used to working remotely. But are there extra things you've started to do to kind of make sure people are OK? <laughs> right now because i yeah, think like, I, mean, um, I got something that's forgotten you know from an operation standpoint is you do have to check on your folks too right yeah we do we every week we've been doing like little activities to keep people engaged uh just to feel like an organization not so not so much segmented and and everyone's all alone um like one example we we sent out a google sheet and had everyone pick their favorite song and we created a company playlist and everybody listened to the to the playlist at the same time to kind of uh, feel like they're connected or in the same space. Um, and we set up like a Quake server for people who are my age who remember Quake. Uh, we, we did like a random Quake server for everyone to jump on. And we've been doing little games here and there. And um, our CEO, Nick, he sends out emails from time to time. And we just do basic calls where everyone can talk about, you know, how they're feeling or things they're going through or challenges they've, they've you know, overcome in their in their home life. Like for me, having, like you said, having kids in the house is really tough sometimes. Uh, between work and them begging for attention, it's it can get a little exhausting. But uh, it's it's like a, the silver lining, obviously, spending more time with your family, and and I think that's really what what you got to look at. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, I paid out some pretty serious bribes this morning to get this hour <laughs> of quiet, uninterrupted time. So it's been yeah, nice. I had to I had to sneak out myself. <laughs> yeah, Nick, I, I did miss a couple of things. Uh, you were talking about the human connection, and I, I totally missed that. Sorry, but um, you know, beyond uh, just doing you know happy hours and things, which we've been doing a ton of like virtual happy hours, like like almost everybody in the in the world is doing now. But um, we actually we actually figured out how to do uh, team trivia contests, um, so competition. So that's one of the things we've been doing every Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday afternoon, I should say. Um, and then we also, we, we do a ton of things when it you know, comes to like, you know, um, music servers, um, you know, um, all kinds of different share outs and things like that. We're, we're trying to get people connected personally, even though it's through Zoom, it's still a way to, you know, have all these um, touch points and make sure people are connected. That, yeah, that stuff is, I think, super important and hard to, you know, hard to put like a a real kind of revenue number two or anything like that, but that culture thing and maintaining that, particularly for companies that have good ones, um, they're seeing that challenge, I think. Maybe companies that have Definitely. bad cultures are actually loving this because no one has to see each other. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, Johanna, let's, uh, at Hopkins, like, it, are you, you know, you're in a little bit of a different, group, I think, than say I am um, or John, but you know, how, 
how are you guys maintaining interaction between your particular team uh, over there as you're trying to manage this huge crisis situation? So, um, yeah, we're, you know, on the, at least on the, on the technology side, you know, so we had, you know, VTC before, um, but if you were working from home, you would just dial in, nobody was using, nobody used video at all. Um, so when we had to, you know, when everyone became fully remote, uh, you know, we were encouraging, you know, almost, you know, requiring people to turn on their video so that, you know, we have that better interaction. And um, so that's been, you know, that was, that was a big culture shift for us uh, since people weren't used to that. Um, and that's really helped engagement. Uh, I think, and like we did things like you know if if people needed a good headset at home kind of thing, we were purchasing headsets and stuff, and letting you know when it became obvious that we're not coming back soon, you know letting people go back to the office and like bring their big monitor i mean it's cr like the monitors that these people yeah you know, we have like people that have like the four monitor set up and stuff i don't think anybody took that home, but you know people that had like a large monitor and they didn't have something at home they you know, let them take that home, even let people take, you know, like, you know, docking stations. And even like, if you don't have a good chair at home, we let people take, take their chair. I was, you know, I went back and got my monitor. Um, I actually opted to buy a chair because I didn't have a good ergonomic chair at home. You know, when I would work from home, I just usually do it from the couch, but then doing that day after day, it was like not working for me. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we're, um, you know, we're continuing to have our, our, you know, our group, our subgroup in IT has, you know, uh, uh, meetings. Uh, so we're having those on, you know, video conference and then having, we implemented a thing where you could anonymously submit questions, et cetera, for, for management to, to answer. So you could ask the really tough questions and, and get some answers to those. Um, and you know the the larger IT organization is still continuing to have their their meetings on a when I do my staff meetings, uh, which I have once a week. We um, you know they all you know they start off they're now they're starting off and spending more time with you know how's everybody doing how was your weekend you know and like sharing some like what what did you do fun this weekend kind of thing and then when I have my one on one meetings. I am, sp I'm definitely spending more time on, you know, how are you, you know, how are you holding up? How's your family? You know, how, if you have kids, you know, how's that going? And we've got, you know, I've got, you know, people with, you know, the whole gamut from, a, you know, somebody that's got a newborn and like a toddler to people that have teenagers that are in high school and stuff. Um, it's interesting to see the, you know, the differences between all of that and then being, you know, flexible to, you know, allow them to work whatever crazy hours they need to, you know, there's no more thing as core hours anymore. You know, if you've, if, if you and your wife have to split up the day to deal with the kids and you, you know, you're working, you know, at night or on the weekends, you know, that's, we're just being as flexible as we can so that people can do what they need to do. That's the, it's the name of the game now. Yeah. You, you talk about, taking stuff out of the office. I look like I was robbing the place when I left. <laughs> I had two monitors under my hands and like wires. Yeah. So um, yeah, we've had a big thing with that too. Making sure everybody has what they need is big. I think some of the things that you might underestimate or, you know, some organizations might underestimate from a remote work is that, you know, you don't necessarily know what someone has at home at all. Like, do they have a decent internet connection? Do they have decent Wi-Fi in their house? So We've tried to provide technical support to people in their homes as well, which is always a little bit weird and challenging, um, but is kind of a big deal. Like if the home is the office, you have to be able to extend your support out to that home environment, um, which is a challenge we've, I think we've all had to deal with a little bit. Uh, I think that the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is, is kind of this, like going back, not everybody, was set up to do this when it happened. Um, but I think a lot of companies maybe maybe were on some level because we've started to see this transition to cloud-based uh, solutions and you know uh, remote 
capable systems, right? And for us, when I first arrived at this organization, it was five people, you know, and there's a few lawyers and a couple of player relations people just trying to keep this thing running on, a, on the tightest possible staff for what the job was. Um, since then, we've grown to close to 20. And, you know, when I got there, it was, a, it was what you might expect from that off, small office situation. There was a server in the break room. You know, the people had to remote in to check their email. Um, it was, uh, there was a, a whole thing. And so I made a big move, which is always a challenge to take us up into the cloud. We moved to Google Suite for all of our email and document storage. We, you know, we added a, a new database so people could access contact information and player information remotely from wherever they were because our guys travel a lot, which is important. Um, and we got a lot of support also from Electrana, who uh, John mentioned earlier in setting that up. My technical expertise is okay, um, but uh, from an you know from understanding what the company needs, that's why they ended up hiring me in the first place. You know, they were looking for a communications person, and I came in for an interview and told them that they didn't need one of those; they needed one of me. Um, and <laughs> the whole way I sold that was, you need to modernize, and so we did that. And everybody uh, hated me for a while. Um, but eventually, you know, people start to see the value. And then this happened and suddenly I look like prescient. Um, <laughs> so interested in how you guys got your organizations to a point where this transition was possible. Um, and I think we'll go maybe in a little different order. Maybe Adam can talk first about like, um, you know, what was the change over time? When did this sort of transition start for you guys to be capable? You're obviously ahead of that curve as a more of a technology based company anyway, but it's still interesting to think about like how, how you thought about moving stuff to the cloud, moving stuff so it's accessible remotely, et cetera. So for us, when I joined EO like three, three and a half years ago, pretty much everything was already cloud based. Um, so I didn't have to push for that. The one thing that wasn't was our phone system. Um, and that was a challenge because our operations team has to basically be in the office to take calls. So um, my push for that was we need to move to the cloud. Uh, we need to be able to answer calls from anywhere just in case of, a, I didn't use the word pandemic at the time, but it's a perfect example. Um, our CEO kind of didn't believe in the, the old VoIP cloud sound quality. He was worried about patients getting dropped uh, off calls. So. That was really the biggest challenge. Um, but like I said, we were pretty much cloud-based um, for, I'd say, 95% of what we were doing. So I, I kind of came into a good situation already when the previous person had already had the foresight to have everything already be in the cloud. And did you, you guys move to Voice over IP set up now? Yeah, guys... yeah we, we moved right away, right when I was joining Heal. I, I pushed for it. Um, we ended up going with Ring Central. Um, which allows our doctors to call patients in the field without um, exposing their personal numbers. Uh, there's a lot of nice features that we have and, and they're HIPAA compliant, which is great. Um, so it solves a lot of our security issues from the, uh, the voice perspective. Yeah, we actually moved to Ring Central as well. And um, I don't think anyone really understood the change because they still right. had phones on their desk until this happened. And then they're like, oh wait, I can use this app to- Exactly. It calls. The best is they can get text messages from players without using their own number, and they right. didn't realize that that was the case. So there's right. been a, this is this has given me again a nice little boost. Exactly, and, and I, it's funny when this happened. I, I um, our CEO sent out an email talking about you know working from home, and uh, I, I wrote back to him saying you know all these all these business continuity tests we've been doing looks like everything worked out perfectly and his response was trial by fire, which is like the best way to test something. So yeah. it worked out. Well, we're, we're in that, I think. Uh, yeah. No doubt. Uh, so, uh, Jahan, how about, how about you? Like what, a, you know, what was the prep like for this or yeah. not even just for this, but in general to making your, you know, cause you obviously, as you said before, you have to be in the space more often because of security concerns. Uh, because of what you do, but it still seems like from what you've been saying that there's been a transition to more people working remotely. You know, how were you guys prepared to do that? What sort of tech did you have in place? Yeah, so, oh, I'm sorry, did you say John or Johan? 
yeah, yeah. Did, am I saying your name wrong? <laughs> Jahan. Yeah, you got it. Jahan. Okay. Jahan. Okay. Sorry. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we, you know, I mean, I think everyone sees the the writing on the wall that, you know, cloud, you know, court different organizations like Microsoft and, and Apple and et cetera, you know, they're, they're moving their, their feature, the new features to the cloud. They're st slowing or stopping support for on-prem solutions, et cetera. So we've been, you know, slowly trying to push things in that, in that direction. Um, you know, when I started uh, three and a half years ago, you know, we could not manage our Macs off, off the network. Um, so that was one of the first things I tackled was to make sure that, you know, no matter where you were, we could still manage your Macs. Um, you know, the, the Windows folks are still on-prem only. Um, so that, so with this transition, that's, that's been a little struggle for them, but, you know, for most of what people have to do for work, they have to be VPN in anyway. Um, you know, cause a lot of our, you know, our, e you know, to get to email, you gotta be on our VPN. Um, and you know, a lot of the stuff that's, you know, on the, on the network, but we are slowly starting, we had started to transition some of the stuff and adopt, you know, but the, the issue there is, you know, we need stuff to be, you know, fed ramp and, you know, uh, DFARS and CUI, HIPAA compliant and all that stuff. So, you know, we've got a lot of hurdles to adopt some of these cloud stuff, things that, you know, some people don't have to deal with. Um, but, you know, we have a, a lot of laptop users and, you know, with the little bit that, you know, some folks were working from home, you know, we, some, you know, people were ready for that. The thing that, you know, um, you know, got, the thing that I saw most was, you know, people not having a, a space, you know, sort of dedicated to, you know, being able to work from home you know, all the time. Like, I think like that, that was one of the things that uh, was an issue for, for some folks, you know, just not, you know, doing it occasionally, like you get by with, you know, what you have kind of thing, but then having to go a hundred percent was, uh, you know, th that's where some of the cracks <laughs> were, were revealed. Right. Yeah, I definitely hear that. Um, which, you know, trial by fire, right. We start to find uh we pour a bunch of water in the bucket and see where it leaks kind of situation. Um, we're, we're in it right now. Uh, John, I, I'll throw it to you now because uh, I can, made everybody confused by saying the name's weird, but uh, <laughs> jump on in. Yeah, you know, we, um, I can't say we were not caught by surprise, but we had a little bit of a, a jump ahead because um, of, of most people. Um, we ended up having to test our disaster recovery plan in at the end of 2019 um, because we had a flood in our building. And, um, you know, it, it ended up with $60,000 in damages, but the, what, it, what it did is kind of a blessing in disguise in that it, it forced us to work from home at that point. Um, everybody's on laptops. Um, so we kind of had a jump start on, on, you know, this remote, remote working piece. Um, and, you know, I think because of that, we were kind of a little bit more prepared than we would have been if, if that didn't happen. Um, no, that makes sense. I think one of the things for us is that, you know, the majority of our people, particularly our, you know, permanent staff is all on laptops, you know, mainly Mac now, so MacBooks. Um, but I do have a handful of, you know, for our law clerks and people of, of desktops, um, which is kind of an issue at this point. Um, mm. And it makes one think that, you know, perhaps a better choice, even for people that are coming in and out, is something that can be moved remotely uh, if, if necessary. Um, you know, you can still dock it and have a desktop set up but at least if we need to send everybody home because the world <laughs> slips into a pandemic, uh, we're capable. So hardware is actually something that I hadn't thought as much about as I had thought about the kind of cloud-based sort of software side of it. It's the same here. We, we ended up having to have people sign out their you know, large monitors and things like that uh, just so they can help them set up at home, just like uh, you know, Han was saying. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's a big deal. Um, I'm curious from you guys, you know, what, if, the, if this has revealed actually anything that you're seeing as a, a, a challenge. So my, one of mine was that I have a couple of people who left the office with, you know, nothing in hand um, because of their, you know, their part-time uh, law clerks and they were set up with interchangeable kind of shared desktop situations and we didn't have a good solution for that out of the box. Um, that's been a big thing we've noticed. The other thing, of course, for us that I brought up earlier is that in addition to our relatively small staff, we have 700 players that we need to stay connected with. And so finding solutions for holding meetings with very large groups of guys has been a thing. What we're doing right now is where we've landed on this, is we've done a lot of sort of Zoom webinars uh, with our players. It allows us to interact with guys and to take questions from them and to speak to them face-to-face-ish um, in a way that, you know, a few years ago, if we hadn't been able to do that, sort of holding everybody together and making sure everybody understood what was going on would have been even more challenging. So um, I'm curious if you've seen anything that's come specifically out of this crisis that said, this is something I want to fix going forward and want to make stronger because I've recognized it from what's happening now. Um, and I'll go right back to you, John, since I'm still looking at you on my screen. <laughs> So the question is more like what 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 kind of things were we going to be implementing in the future based on what what we've what we're we're dealing with now? Is that right? Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. Have we seen any weaknesses or challenges that we could maybe try to fix in the future? Definitely. Um, you know, I think you know we're going to continue to use our virtual collaboration platform. I think people have just uh, fell in love with it. Um, they think that you know there's a you know, we we have a large uh, building here in Cincinnati um, and, and in Chicago, we have a, a smaller building, but um, the, even though it's a large building, the conference room space was limited. Um, so having this virtual space has enabled, will, will enable us to kind of be able to um, not have to wait for conference rooms, things like that, keep, keep the work up. Um, and it's, it's a big benefit to us. So that's one thing that we're going to continue to do. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, that's that's probably the biggest thing for us. Um, the other thing is we're probably going to still do a lot of the virtual culture things as well because I think people really love it, and and I think that's been a big enhancement to our our company. Uh, and Adam, same sort of thing for you. You know, again, I keep repeating this a little bit, but you guys are a little more, you know, built for this in some ways, but. Um, have you noticed, has anything come out of this particular uh, crisis that's led you to think about places where your systems could be strengthened or the way you do things could be improved to accommodate the future, which is pretty uncertain at this point? Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's kind of, I want to say it's done the opposite. It's kind of made us realize that, hey, maybe we don't need an office this size. <laughs> Uh, maybe we could potentially move to something smaller or maybe we could be a full uh, work from home company for, you know, obviously not everyone in the company, but um, so it's kind of shifted us the other way where we can say, okay, maybe we just need a medical storage supply area and a place for employees to come in and maybe hold a meeting if they need to do a face to face. Um, because like I said, we've been, you know, we've been pretty much ready for this, uh, thankfully. Um, but it is, it, it, there's still that face-to-face -face aspect that basically you can have as many virtual meetings as you want, but sometimes things cannot be said properly or, or like the, 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 the message doesn't come across the same as if you're sitting in the same room with somebody. So I think that's been, I think people are realizing that. And I, and I think people are, I think they're missing coming to the office. So, but when before people loved working from home now, they're like, please, I want to come back. When can we come back? Yeah, I, I think I agree. I think it's done two things. It's made it clear that it is much more possible to be effective from home than we may be anticipated. I feel like our team has worked very well. We have a very, very busy, difficult time right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like our team has really done well. Um, but at the same time, it definitely makes you think about and understand the value of actually seeing other humans um, in a way that you yeah. might not have realized prior. So, yeah. 
Um, Jahan, can you speak to the same sort of thing? Is there any, like, what are the things you, I think you mentioned with your Windows team that, you know, they're, they're maybe realizing that they should be able to be a little more remote, but for your team and for what you're doing, um, what sort of issues are you seeing that you think you want to improve upon or correct as a, as a result of this? Yeah. Um, the, uh, so I, I'll, mirror john's comment about the conference rooms for my group uh we're like 65 people in my subgroup of it and we have one conference room and so scheduling one on and i share an office um so scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings is was <laughs> was a real pain um so that's that's been one benefit and i think you know something that i might you know continue to do using vtc to to have those sometimes uh, when it, you know, so I can have them on a regular basis and, or maybe, you know, mix it in. Um, the other thing is, you know, our, um, you know, our VPN, uh, so our VPN capacity was, you know, we were not scaled to have everybody working from home, you know, so that was immediately, you know, overrun and had to be increased. Our, our internet bandwidth also needed to be increased. Um, even our, so we have on, you know, on-prem phone, we are, you know, so that, that had the phone circuits got overloaded or we had on-prem, uh, you know, VTC that was overloaded, you know, so everything, you know, all this stuff that, you know, had, had been working fine before with the amount that we were doing was not scaled to, to handle this. So that, that's all gotten better. But then, you know, another thing was the, you know, onboarding people. So, you know, now that, so we, part of the reason we made the Macs available over the internet was so we could take advantage of DEP and do a more, you know, automate, you know, user centric uh, onboarding process for the, for the systems. Um, but even, even so, you know, with our security requirements, we were still required to wipe the system when it came, when it was shipped in. And then, so, you know, there is still one step that, the IT folks are doing before they hand it over, which is to, you know, wipe the drive, reinstall the OS and then hand it over. Um, so we're working on, you know, trying to get that, you know, get it approved to, you know, trust the, trust the shipped OS, prove that, you know, the T2 chip is, you know, protecting that. And, you know, you can, you know, it's not been tampered with or, you know, trusting the chain of trust that's there. Um, so that's something that we want to get so that we could drop ship something to somebody if they, if they needed it and not have to even touch IT's hands before it got into the hands of the user. Um, another tough thing we've been doing is uh, we get a lot of interns in the summer. So anywhere from 400 to 700 interns a year. Um, so those guys get prepping all those machines and stuff, you know, is, is difficult. So that'd be another big, help with with that and you know uh i know the windows team is looking toward you know in tune and and stuff but they're you know we're not we're not there yet because of, we've got to get into you know the gcc high azure tenant and it's expensive and you know so there's there's some hurdles there but you know those kinds of things are are things that we're looking to streamline very cool yeah, no, there's, and, and it's interesting to see the differences in kind of the technical needs of different organizations the, the you know, the way different people have to work, you know, for Adam's company, maybe that remote work is more possible than it is for others. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So we're running close to the end here, but the last thing I want to just throw out there is the sort of what's next question. And I, you know, John touched on it a little bit, like, what are we keeping from this? What are we, what are we thinking? How is this going to affect the way our teams work in the future? What new things do we want to be able to add? You know, I can say from our perspective that um, this change to remote work and this change to cloud-based systems has, you know, when it was first introduced, there was some resistance to what we were trying to do. Now people have really embraced it. And it's an opportunity for someone like me in my organization to continue making the kinds of changes and continue 
um, shifting things with from a political perspective, right? The the people at the head of player relations and our ED are they understand more of what's what's at stake and why this is important than maybe they did uh, a few months ago. They've always been fairly supportive. I don't want to throw them under the bus, but. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's, you're used to doing things a certain way. Being asked to change the way you do them can be challenging. I think this huge drastic change has opened some opportunities to, um, to push you a little harder and to innovate a little bit more. Uh, and I know that that's something we're going to be focused on over the next year in our organization, particularly from a data infrastructure standpoint, which is a big thing for us um, over in the coming year, sort of making sure we get everything we still have lots of paper records from years and years ago, things like that, that we need to make accessible to people. And we're going to be working on that and making sure that's all cloud-based and remotely accessible and secure um, are all part of our sort of upcoming year or so. And this, this thing has really driven the way we think about that in a lot of ways. Uh, but let's just go around really quick, maybe speak to kind of what we see going forward. And then we'll have a couple of minutes here for some questions. Uh, so we'll just go down the list here. John, if you want to start us off. Yeah, definitely. I did touch on a few things, but, uh, you know, obviously the from a personnel standpoint and culture standpoint, the, uh, you know, the idea of being much more flexible is, you know, I think um, going to be increased for sure in our company. The fact that we can and we feel much more confident working remotely, it's going to enable us to, you know, have more flexibility with whether it be hours or, you know, people having different locations, things like that. Um, the other thing it's going to be uh, that it's really affected is our, our capabilities and our offerings to our clients. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of these virtual innovation sessions or ideation sessions for brand strategy and things like that. Um, and I think we're, we're kind of leading the pack in our industry a little bit and, and we're building a lot of these capabilities up and, and I do believe that's going to continue for quite a while. I like, the, I like the, the bringing in that, uh, the client side. It's something we haven't talked a lot about, but is a big thing. I mean, I think about that with our players a little bit, but same thing, like how, how is this changing the relationship with your outside clients? And it's very interesting. And Adam spoke yeah. to that a little bit too. So Adam, I'll throw to you to, to, to talk about uh, what you see going forward. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of people are going to realize that this whole work from home proof of concept has mm -hmm. been you know, pretty fruitful. I think a lot of companies see that 90% of, well, depending on the, the industry, but pretty much everything you do can be done remotely now. And, and I think that seeing where, whereas they were hesitant prior to pushing things to the cloud, I think you'll see a rush to, to the opposite to where companies are now want, gonna wanna push as much of what they have infrastructure wise to the cloud. Um, and it's actually, um, it's funny because I see somebody already asked a question, like, how would we have handled this 10 years ago? It's something that I think about every day. Um, it's it's so strange because 10 years ago when VoIP was, you know, becoming more mainstream, I mean, what would we have done with, with landline phones that we'd have to forward everything to mobile devices or, I mean, it would have been, it would have been a disaster. So, and I think a lot of the um, home-based internet has really helped us, so it, you know, like for me, I have like a 300 meg down, uh, um, bandwidth pipe in my house. I mean, if you think about it, 10 years ago, people had like 25 megs. So these, these Zoom meetings where you have 50 people on, uh, it just wouldn't work well. So I think the, the world has caught up in terms of, you know, well, I would say, you know, first world has caught up in terms of these, um, these challenges that they might have faced 10 years ago. Yeah, I think the bandwidth thing is a great example. You know, I have four Zoom meetings going on simultaneously in my house yeah. a lot of times with kids in school and my wife teaching. Um, and that you're right. Then and maybe we can loop that in that question. What how how would this have been handled ten years ago, um, Jahan? When you when you talk a little bit about uh, what you see going forward, but it'd be also interesting to hear your answer to that question. How would this have what would have happened if this had occurred ten years ago for your guys? Um, geez. So I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I will say the same thing that John and Adam were saying that, you know, the, this, this whole thing is really proven to, you know, to the organization that remote work is, is viable and that we really haven't seen any 
you know, degradation in the quality of work or the volume of, of work. In fact, you know, a lot of people, a lot of my staff say they feel like they're working more now than they were when they actually came into the office because having that separation between work and home is now very blurred. Um, but uh, 10 years ago, that would, that'd be really tough. Um, yeah, the ban bandwidth would have been a huge issue. Um, you know, we, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I can't, I can't even imagine what it would be like, you know, it would, it would have been, it would have been tough. But, you know, we, we had, you know, we had VPN and, and people did have, you know, there would be much, many fewer laptops, I believe. Um, so I think people would have been taking their, uh, desktops home with them. Uh, and actually said that they, some people did take them home during this because, you know, we had, did have people that were only had a desktop at work and they didn't have a laptop. Um, but yeah, it would have, it would have been tough. <laughs> yeah, no, I can, I can definitely agree with that. I think, you know, even a few years ago with the systems we had in place, there's certainly, it would have been a higher risk scenario. We would have had more people having to go into the office, uh, even if we staggered it and created protocols for it. You know, we know from what we're hearing from health experts that those indoor air conditioned spaces are the, are the riskiest. And we certainly would have had our staff at a lot higher risk. Um, you know, whereas now nobody needs to go there. Um, it's kind of sad in a way, you know, we did a lot of work making it look nice. Uh, <laughs> now nobody needs to visit. Uh, I will, I think we have just a couple more minutes. I just throw out that if anyone does have a question that they want to ask, the, the little Q and A button there at the bottom, we'll let you, uh, let you type that in. Um, but I, I'll also throw this out just to, uh, to you guys. Um, when you're thinking, because you brought this up, John, which is why I want to think about it, is, is there is a scenario, obviously, where we've had this little bit of change in work. And even in this circumstance, some of us are still hiring. So what is it like to onboard employees and bring people into an organization when you're not bringing them into an office? I just did this recently myself. Um, and it is definitely way different. Um, you know, I had my sort of intro call with a new law clerk uh, via Google Hangouts and walked him through our systems and security. Um, but it's it's certainly a different feel. Uh, and also there are the challenges of obviously getting people the equipment they need, the, the things that they need. So interested in hearing from you guys how you're thinking about that if this crisis continues longer which it seems likely to consider considering what's going on um and how you're thinking about bringing in new employees which hopefully we all still get to do on some level i don't know uh, adam let's start with you <laughs> so yeah we've we've been doing uh so hr usually will onboard somebody from a uh, hr perspective they do they do some training for a few days on their personal device um, we do send out like a mac laptop um, so basically the Macs, are, I have like a living room full of Apple computers that I just basically send out and the DEP handles the rest. Um, we assign them to the specific employee, they log in and, and it kind of provisions their laptop for them. Um, and uh, they, HR actually helps out by setting up the, kind of walking them through the initial tech, setting up their email, going through and, and creating their um, passwords and, and setting up all the company systems and stuff like that, that automatically get assigned to them based on what group they belong to. Um, and it's really all Zoom. Uh, they, they just do everything Zoom. And if, if the individual uh, lives close to the LA office, we I'll just drive over to the office, drop it off. They'll come in, pick it up if they want. Otherwise we FedEx it to them. Gotcha. That's, that's pretty much it. And John, have you done, have you guys brought anybody on during this or are you anticipating doing so? Uh, yes, we actually have. Uh, just recently, we, we hired a, a person, uh, two people actually, and, um, and you know, we, we didn't have too much trouble with it because of, uh, you know, we mentioned Electrona. They, they do everything remotely from Washington, D.C. Um, they, when it comes to new, new people, they're, they're able to set up the physical laptops and then ship them to, to the person um, and, then, and then actually train them remotely on, on some of the systems. And um, then we also have internal folks uh, in you know, operations and HR that, that also do the same thing, but mostly through Zoom. Right on. 
And uh, Jahan, you, you spoke to this already a little bit, but do you want to add anything from, from your perspective or thinking about going forward, what might be changing in terms of onboarding people? I mean, you have these interns maybe starting this summer? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we definitely, some of them, some of them were not, um, cause if the work that they had to do would require them to be on campus, those interns were, were actually turned down or we canceled those internships. I haven't personally had to, uh, onboard anybody since this started, but I know that we are doing, you know, video calls to, you know, interview them, et cetera. Um, and that, uh, you know, the field services folks are coming in and prepping systems at the, at the lab and then, uh, shipping them to people's houses and stuff. Um, and he, we do have some interns that are, you know, coming because we get them from all over the country. They're coming into the, into, into Maryland and wherever, and then we're shipping it to that, wherever their location is there. So there are still yeah. interns happening. <laughs> That's gotta be a challenge, both from an intern perspective and a management perspective, but probably the subject of a different call. Um, well, I think we are about out of time and Whoever's uh, running this from behind the scenes can tell me if that's not true. Um, but I want to thank you guys for taking the time this morning to to talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's interesting to see how different, particularly different size and completely different focused industries are affected by this. Um, and I think it's been broadly surprising to me how. Um, over the last few years, companies have just moved themselves into positions where this has been an easier transition for a lot of them than uh, they might have even expected it to be. So uh, the lessons learned will be, it'll be interesting to see going forward how this changes, how people do business and how people work. And we'll be keeping an eye on it. Um, but thanks again. And thanks everybody who joined us today. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And we'll be on, I guess, uh, we'll keep an eye on Slack and answer some questions and do things like that. So if anybody has anything they want to ask me, I'll certainly keep an eye over there. Um, and thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. It was great. Yeah, it was, it was great to have you uh, for this panel. The next session will be uh, in five minutes um, with uh, Brian Bassett uh, starting for a short uh, track and then Eric Boyle. The link is on Slack. Uh, so see you in five minutes, everyone.